It is now my pleasure to introduce a first-generation fellow from the Johanna Quant Young Academy who has been selected from, by the community of fellows and members to deliver the keynote lecture on their behalf. But before doing so, I would like to tell you a bit about her academic and professional background and her current research, which reflect the mission and goals that the Young Academy has for high potential early career researchers. Sandra Eckert has studied in Germany, France, the UK, and she conducted her PhD research in the European University uh, Institute in Florence, Italy. She is a specialist in European integration, EU politics, and the single European market. Sandra is particularly interested in the dynamics and effects of economic and social regulation at a national, European, and international level. The breadth of her research on policy issues concerning the environment to financial markets, the different actors that have a role to play in the regulatory process, and the reach of her interest from the national boundaries and beyond are in sync with the multidisciplinary and the multinational nature of the Johanna Kwan Young Academy. Sandra holds a Marie Curie Co-Fund Fellowship to conduct research as an associate professor at the Aarhus Institute for Advanced Studies in Denmark. She is on leave from the Goethe University, where she is a junior professor with a focus on politics in the European multi-level system. She is also the author of two books on regulation in the single European market and has published in journals such as the Journal of European Public Policy, the Journal of European Integration and Regulation and Governance. Please welcome Sandra Eckert, who's joining us online. Good afternoon. It is an honor and great pleasure to give this keynote lecture today, and I thank my colleagues at the Joanna Quant Young Academy for this opportunity to represent them. As a first generation fellow, I would like to begin by sharing some of the experiences we have had in the previous years of the Young Academy. Through its events, the Young Academy has been able to drive academic exchange beyond its walls with the Goethe University, other research partners in the region, and further afield. In October 2019, and this is what you see on the slide, we hosted a two-day workshop with scientists, policymakers, and representatives from civil society and business at the permanent rep representation of the state Hessen to the European Union in Brussels. The Academy hopes to resume similar activities in the near future. Such outreach allows us to contribute to addressing the complex problems our society is facing. Two generations of fellows and members currently form the Academy. We comprise a community of 15 researchers we come from various disciplines, including biology, history, pharmacy, political science, linguistics, philosophy, physics, media studies, physical geography, and medicine. We are affiliated to 14 departments and different institutes. Our members, as has been mentioned already, hold prestigious grants such as Eminuta or ERC, and are participants in other young academies that exist in Germany. The Young Academy of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences and Humanities, the German National Academy of Sciences Leopoldina, the Young Academy of Sciences and Literature Mainz. We fellows are selected on the basis of our outstanding academic achievements, and many of us have an international background. We cover a wide range of research topics which include the correlation between cell morphology, function, and the underlying molecular features, social memories in the Greek cities during late Hellenistic times, the origins of the deep sea biodiversity, the history of artificial environments and the internet of things, the role of business actors in shaping environmental policy, the impact of climate change on freshwater resources. Being part of the Academy gives us extra freedom and independence in conducting our research and addressing these research topics. I have myself had the chance to hold a sabbatical fellowship for one semester 
which allowed me to focus entirely on research and publication activities at a crucial stage in my career. Moreover, having ex access to additional funding is crucial for all of us to implement our research ideas, especially for the natural scientists among us who are often constrained in their activities by the type of expensive equipment they have at their disposal. As I speak to you today, and this is a great pleasure, the Academy is welcoming its third generation of excellent researchers. We welcome eight outstanding academics from sociology, mathematics, history, political science, film and media studies, and philosophy. Under normal circumstances, we will meet for a more formal and distinguished ceremony. And on the left hand side here, you can see photographs of our first opening ceremony. You can also see a photograph of our opening day in 2020, which was, of course, already compliant with the specific circumstances. I also have fond memories of the Academy's previous years of normal activity before the pandemic dramatically changed our work routines and daily lives. As of September 2018, we held meetings at the Riedberg campus on a regular basis. Me, as a social scientist based on Western campus, and if you know Frankfurt, it's really in the core of the city, it was, I must admit, because of the academy that I had a reason to come to the scientist campus for the first time. I have learned a great deal in the discussions with researchers from very different backgrounds, which in the first year of the academy, as you can see on this slide, centered on the theme of nature and normativity. This brings me to the topic of today's lecture, namely the annual themes that guide the Academy's intellectual life and the disciplinary exchange. Towards the end of our first year in the Academy, we fellows and members designated the Academy's subsequent theme. This theme was applied throughout 2019 and 2020. The theme we have been discussing in these meetings is structured around three concepts, namely tenets, variations, and transformations. These concepts might sound rather abstract to you, and you might have very different ideas about these concepts, depending on your own background and experience. This is exactly what instigated this, the discussions in the academy. When a marine biologist explains her tenet to a philosopher, it is a sense of curiosity, excitement, and at times even irritation. Let me take you on an intellectual journey to give you a flavor of the academy's life and share with you the kind of reflections and thoughts that our group assembled on tenets, variations, and transformations. Tenet is a word that we rarely use in our everyday language. The term originally derives from the Latin word tenere, which means to hold. German translations are Grundsatz, Lehre, or Dogma. A tenet can be regarded as a fundamental principle. Tenets, one could argue, are at the core of a scientific paradigm if we adhere to the notion suggested by the philosopher of science, Thomas Kuhn. We in the academy cover a broad range of scientific disciplines, ranging from the natural sciences, linguistics, to social sciences. The starting point for our discussion was the very basic question. What do we conceive as being a tenet in our discipline. We have come up with manifold answers across disciplines, as you can imagine, and I cannot elaborate on all of them due to time constraints. Instead, I will focus on a few. For the natural scientists among us, there is, I think, literally no better example for an overarching tenet than the central dogma of molecular biology. DNA makes RNA makes protein. The protein is generally described as a gene product, which defines the phenotype, which are the features of an organism. 
This is a sentence to be found in textbooks since the late 1970s. The claim was originally established by Francis Crick and since then was repostulated in an incomplete way thousands of times. It states that we store and preserve our inheritable genetic information in the form of DNA, while the gene products are provided by proteins in all possible forms like hair, hormones, or enzymes. We transfer the transfer of genetic information from DNA to protein is mediated by the messenger RNA. It is according to the most basic rules of mathematics and physics, we can call these natural laws, that DNA is transcribed into RNA. Compared to the hard sciences, our tenets, tenets in the social sciences and humanities often appear more vulner vulnerable and less stable. This also has to do with our objects of scientific inquiry. If we take history as an example, we first have to agree on the kind of sources we study. Over the past centuries, the discipline has established agreement regarding the possibilities and limits of our different sources, texts, materials, etc., in order to achieve reliable research outputs. Second, historians have to develop a common understanding or tenets as to how they analyze and, inter and interpret their ob objects of studies. Such a common understanding is the result of academic traditions and research experience. Commonly accepted standards allow for comparability. Agreeing on common standards, naturally, is of equal importance in the life sciences. Let me illustrate this with an example from the field of marine biology. Global hydrological modeling relies on standardized data collection, which follows the FAIR principles, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. At times, the accumulation of data and their analysis may lead us to question our tenets. Even what we usually consider a natural law is not made for eternity, let me go back to our DNA example to illustrate this. New findings have shown that the production of gene products from DNA cannot fully be explained by the model. As a result, the model still holds true in its most principal concept, but needs extension on other aspects such as temporal and spatial variation. It also needs extension on the tenet because proteins are not the only molecules that define the phenotype. How do we then best respond to such new findings? Are we better off putting certain tenets to one side to allow novel ones to inform our concepts? In the humanities and social sciences, we are used to the idea that our tenets are not matters of fact, but rather represents the current state of knowledge in our discipline. And that different tenets might even coexist in line with different theoretical approaches. But also in the natural sciences, as our example has illustrated, we need to put our hypothesis to empirical scrutiny. In normal times, to again use the terms of Thomas Kuhn, who has discussed the history of science, mainly referring to examples of the natural sciences, this might mean that we adapt our tenets, but we do not need to reject them. In times of scientific revolutions, by contrast, we have to fundamentally change our tenets as we move to a different paradigm of doing science. Galileo Galilei's achievements are probably the most eminent example of such a scientific revolution. The situation becomes even more complicated once we engage in interdisciplinary exchange. While we might find it hard to share common tenets across disciplines, this conversation can help us to sharpen our understanding of other disciplines' assumptions and basic principles or even to become more aware 
of our own wants. Such an awareness can be crucial to understand the limitation of our field of research. This exchange might, under certain conditions, even allow us to come up with tenets that are informed by different disciplines. In this case, we transgress interdisciplinary practice and engage in truly transdisciplinary research. Tenets then are difficult but necessary concepts for scientific research and debate. They are necessary because in order to achieve a meaningful result, scientists need to formulate tenets that are abstract, simplifying, and at times even simplistic. The process of reduction and standardization is a necessary precondition for categorization, scientific inquiry, and theorization. At the same time, tenets must be grounded in reality and reality, life, nature and society is full of variation. These variations are a result of evolution, chance and change and a necessary requirement for survival, even in the smallest units of our existence, our DNA. Variation in nature and human behavior represents perhaps the greatest challenge for scientific research. As a result, scientific research needs to take variation into consideration. To begin with, when defining their object of study, scientists need to develop models of variation, that is, classifications and typologies. Indeed, nature cannot be studied without reference to its variations. Let me give an example from hydrology. Global water models try to simulate the variations in the terrestrial water cycle on a global scale while excluding the ocean component and the water quality. History, society and politics too cannot be analyzed in any meaningful way without attention to variation. Historians, for instance, study us humans who are erratic, impulsive and irrational objects of analysis. Variation is thus the norm in historical sciences. This, together with the contingency factor of the surviving material, means that while there are certain patterns or rhetorical structures that can be observed, such as in literary words, inscriptions or coins, no source is like another. Every source is unique. When studying political systems, to give another example, we usually classify them according to fundamental features such as democracy versus authoritarianism. Moreover, we differentiate democratic regime times further. Oftentimes, we do so based on dichotomous typologies, such as the one contrasting parliamentarian versus presidential systems, which focuses on the interaction between legislatures and executives. These examples show how in our research, we try to make sense of variation. Typically, we come up with a more abstract model, typology or classification, which then serves as an analytical tool that allows us to deal with the kind of variation we observe. Biology can help us elaborate on this. In order to analyze the behavior of cells, it is necessary to define their state of being in the first place. One such possibility is the classification of a specific cell type based on morphological criteria or the expression of a certain protein. Through the advancement of methodology, it is now possible to track the morphology and the genetic profile of the cells in question, longitudinally and with high resolution. The use of these advanced methods has shown that many cell types display variations of the originally described cellular morphology, as well as transformations of their genetic signature. These transformations occur in relation to variables such as time or a damaging event, 
like for example, UV light damage on DNA. Based on the occurrence of such transient or permanent variations within the cellular morphology and function, one has to ask the question whether the original classification will still hold true for all identified variations of the cell type. Hence, many scientists now rely on the creation of subclasses to accommodate newly discovered variations of an original cellular phenotype. Even though the initial classification of each specific cell type is necessary to form working hypotheses, a new school of thought advocates a more fluent classification in which cells can transiently move in and out of states of activation. Variation thus highlights the limitations of attempting to classify observed reality. Our schemes of classifying and identifying types impose constraints on research already at the analytical level. Moreover, how we analyze our object of study will differ depending on the schools of thought or theoretical approach we adhere to. While the object studied, be it a historical figure, a language or a cell type, remains the same, different schools of thought or theories influence the way the object is being studied. Let me give an example. In global water modeling, models and the model equations used to describe various processes take very different forms. Such variety has hampered a comprehensive understanding of how models operate, operate why they differ in their simulations and how they can be improved. In the humanities, such as in history, the increasing salience of no notions such as gender or space reorient analytical approaches. Ultimately, this change of view of the observer is conducive to different interpretations of a historical text. These examples illustrate that the same subject matter can be analyzed using different approaches and methods producing variation, not only in scientific models, but also in the kind of findings these generate. While such variety can be problematic, where it makes exchange on comparability difficult, it is also a benefit. Scientific progress is not possible without variation. Variation is a, if not the, necessary precondition for the advancement of knowledge. The more research approaches, models, teams and groups there are, the more potentially useful insights can be gained from them. An appropriate example of this is the current global search for vaccines against COVID-19. Here, coexisting but also collaborative research efforts have resulted in the swift development of a number of new different vaccines. Most importantly, Varying approaches will be crucial in coping with new coronavirus variants. This last example, which links directly to the most pressing challenge we face at this very moment, brings me to the last key concept of this talk, which is transformation. In our view, transformation or the type of transformation which is fueled by an institution such as the Young Academy is twofold. It is about the transformation of us, the fellows and the members of the Academy, and it is about the transformation of society to which we as researchers can make a significant contribution. Let me explain first how we are being transformed through the Young Academy. As mentioned earlier, there is a need for communication, explanation and translation in an interdisciplinary context such as the Academy. This is very, a matter, very much a matter of finding a common language. This effort begins at a fundamental level of assumptions and ontology, tenets, covers our units of analysis and thus engages with variation and subsequently requires a transformation of ourselves. We need to be able to communicate in a way that is intelligible to science, scientists from other disciplines and a wider society, 
but also that is theory free, abstracting from specific theoretic or dogmatic paradigms. Going beyond a narrow disciplinary perspective by reflecting on our disciplinary tenets and variations from a meta level can allow us to engage in a truly transdisciplinary discourse and research practice. From, from a philosophical standpoint, therefore, this presumes that communication between subsystems, in this case, the highly specialized disciplines in the world of academia, is possible. As a Frankfurt-based young academy, we adhere to this Habermasian dictum. Only when we are able to speak to each other and communicate effectively, will we be able to draw on the benefits of this interdisciplinary endeavor. And these benefits go beyond the scientific and research community. These are rewarding for society. By engaging in an exchange with other disciplines, we can raise our awareness of societal problems or even learn of their existence altogether. Let me give an example. When a political scientist from Western campus interested in sustainability issues encounters a scientist from the Senckenberg Research Institute who is conducting research on deep sea biogeography, the synergies may be surprising and groundbreaking. The social scientist, for obvious reasons, will not be aware at all of the kind of sophisticated scientific data and the problems encountered in data collection and analysis of marine biodiversity. However, understanding the key issues at stake will help her a great deal, not only in perceiving and understanding what the policy problems might be, but also in getting a sense of what evidence-based policy making could look like in this specific case. Likewise, the scientists might get a sense of why scientific findings do not directly translate into policy outputs, and that scientific evidence is likely to be used strategically in the political power play. Beyond interdisciplinary exchange, a truly transdisciplinary perspective might be even more rewarding, where transgressing disciplinary boundaries allows us to generate new types of knowledge. Let us remain with the example of biodiversity. Our marine scientist from Senckenberg might change her problem perception altogether when cooperating with our social scientists and vice versa. In short, an integrated view on policy problems such as protecting biodiversity would not only mean to aggregate the distinct problem perceptions of separate disciplines, but to overcome them and take a more encompassing view. Ultimately, such a transformation of ourselves as fellows and members of the Academy is therefore conducing to a transformation in our research practice. And by that means, a significant contribution can be made to transformative processes at the societal level. With better and more encompassing evidence about what these problems are, we can make a difference and will be able to communicate the societal benefits of our research to a wider audience effectively. And this is where the circle closes and where I am close to the end of this lecture. One thing we have learned in the Young Academy is to speak in a comprehensible way about our highly specialized everyday research practice. The exchange at the Young Academy has helped us in order to take a position in the public discourse, drawing on multiple perspectives and not being bound by the narrow confines of a single discipline. This enables us to confront new and unexpected perspectives so that not individually, but rather as a group, we can contribute to and even spark public discourse. And all this thanks to the Academy. I would like to conclude by saying that we fellows and members are deeply grateful to the Johanna Quant Foundation and also to our directors and founding directors for providing us with this 
unique opportunity to establish links across departments, universities and research institutions and to engage in a fruitful interdisciplinary exchange. We are thrilled to see the Johanna Quant community growing and express our warmest welcome to the new fellows, members, distinguished senior scientists and ambassadors. The second generation fellows and members very much look forward to continuing the debate in the next academic year on a new annual topic, which has yet to be defined. On behalf of the first generation of fellows, I would like to express our gratitude and assure you that we will be delighted to continue playing an active part in the Academy as alumni. Thank you very much.